I'm super psyched about that. And Meredith and I and the kids, we had a good time up in Greenville. And uh, so I know Jay's not here, but thank you for Pastor Jay. I know he's probably at home and they're probably watching. So love you. And um, did a great job, as always. And uh, it's good to have a guy like that here, you know, someone you can really count on and you love and trust. So anyway, um, why don't you do me a favor and open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. And we're going to be uh, right there in verse 14. And uh, through 41, 14 through 41, next section of the book of Acts. Um, I just want to say this, like, um, when, you, when you come uh, to the text, and when you come to the, to the Bible, uh, you should do so with intention. Like, don't just read it. A lot of people get into these Bible reading plans, like, it's just like, this is what you're supposed to do. Come to the text with intention, okay? And what I mean by that is every time you read the Bible, whether it's at home or in a study or here in church, you should go with reason like you're going to know who God is you're, that's what you're picking up his book for you want to know who God is you want to understand his nature his character you want to know his desires what makes him happy what makes him sad you want to know his plans you want to know his mission right you want to know about his love you want to know about that stuff right and 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 the reason why you want to know is because he's told us that he wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth Right, so in order to engage your spirit, man, you got to know the truth, okay? And so you you go to the text with some intention. So like every time I open up my Bible to study, it's for a reason. It's not just to study because that's what a Christian's supposed to do. You're supposed to go with an intention, like a purpose, right? Every time you go. So not only are you going to find out about God, but you want to know also, like, according to the Bible, who am I? Who am I in him? How, how do I personally, right? And then we corporately, how should we respond to who God is, right? Respond to his love, respond to his nature, respond to his mission, and partnering with him to accomplish such a mission like that's when you read the bible i want you to go to the bible with that in mind like you're going on purpose right so every time you enter this room here at revolution church you should enter the room on purpose right and i don't mean like i want to hear a good speech all right that that's not what it is you can see those on ted talks on the on the internet right and and, and you don't want to just listen to a good speech on how to live you want to come on purpose. Now, I don't mean on purpose like um, it wasn't a mistake, like I meant to come kind of a thing on purpose. Not that. On purpose meaning I came on mission. I came with intention. Like I, I'm walking into this room on purpose, like on mission. I'm, I'm, I'm here for a reason, right? I'm on this thing. You come in, and, and, and every single time you come, it should be, uh, God, instruct me, teach me, uh, give me the tools that I need, point me in the right direction. I'm on this thing. And so my question to you this evening, faithful ones, are you there? you got to examine your heart, right? you got to know why, why are you here. Are you, if you're here, listen, I can talk to you. We're, we're all friends here, right? If you're here because, like, here they are. they got their greeter shirts on. I'm here because I had to greet. I'm here because I had to do the computer. I'm here because I had to do Facebook. I'm here because I had to teach the kids. I personally appreciate obedience. But that's not the reason why you come to this room. You come to this room on purpose. I'm here to learn who you are, to know who I am, and how I'm to respond to you, okay? So examine your heart. Like, why are you here right now? Take a second. Like, that wasn't just part of a speech. Take a second. Figure it out. Search inside. Examine yourself, right? See why you're here. Why are you here? Why are you here tonight? So Jesus makes this promise. Back in Matthew 16, 18. Now we're on it, okay? He makes this promise. He says, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. I'm going to build my church, right? And then, after he makes this claim, this is an amazing claim, the guy dies, He's crucified, he dies, he's buried, he's resurrected, he ascends to heaven, and he sends his spirit. So now the Christian is empowered to tell all the nations about Jesus, about his deity, and the salvation that's available through him alone. So that's why that, that's where we come to right now when Peter's about to preach. All that has happened. 
redemptive story all the way from Genesis all the way to this point right here when Jesus says, I'm going to build my church, and then he gets killed, buried, resurrects, ascends, sends his Holy Spirit, book of Acts chapter 1, sends the Holy Spirit and empowers them to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. And that's where we are right here, right now. It brings us to Peter as he preaches the first message ever in the history of the church of Jesus Christ. Now listen, to fully understand, before we read it, before we fully understand the, the magnitude of what God is doing here in this text and what he wants to do with you and I in his redemptive story, you have to put your, your finger there and you have to go to Acts chapter 4. You, you just, you, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Just look at Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Little, little, little story here, okay? So, so Peter and John, right, all this has happened with, with Jesus, and Peter and John are going around preaching Jesus, right? And the authorities, the religious people, the religious leaders, the ones who, not, listen, they're not like you and me. These guys, they know this book. I'm talking, they know the book, right? And so Peter and John are preaching, and the experts in the religious word right here, right? It says right here in verse 13, the members of the council, these, these amazing religious, the experts, were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures, right? Now, when I read that, doesn't that standard just qualify everybody, <laughs> right? Like now all of a sudden it's like, okay, I don't need to have a seminary degree, like, these guys, they don't know much. And so, so it just opens up the door for everybody. Now, listen, here's the thing about this guy that doesn't know much about the Scriptures. So the, here's the cat out of the bag. At the end of the text that we're going to read in Acts chapter 2, the end result of this guy being bold like this, 3,000 people get saved. This, this Yahoo doesn't know much about anything. He opens his mouth and 3,000 people get saved. He's empowered by the Holy Spirit and he opens his mouth and he tells them what he does know. Which according to the religious folks, the ones who really know the Bible, it ain't much. They don't know, he does, he doesn't, this guy doesn't know much of anything. But he's a willing disciple, empowered by the Spirit, and he boldly professes what he does know. And I know, I know everybody in this room right now. I know all you guys know a lot. See, that's the thing. I know you know a lot. So actually, you're actually more qualified, I think, than Peter. But Peter was bold, and he shared what he did know. He wasn't an expert by any means, but he was a willing disciple of Jesus with just this rudimentary knowledge of who Jesus is, a, a, a sophomoric, uh, junior varsity level understanding of the Scriptures is what these guys would say. But he opened his mouth. Doesn't that help you? Makes me feel like, hey, maybe I could do something, right? Qualifies everybody. So let's look here in Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read a pretty extended section of Scripture. I hope you enjoy it. Um, Acts chapter 2. You know, I was sharing with my, my brother Don here this week before I read he was asking me about how I preach. Why, how, why do I preach? The way I do. And I explained to him that, and I hope it helps, but God wrote a book. Right? He didn't, he didn't need anyone's help. The Bible, whether people want to knock it or not, and listen, the whole world's been trying to knock it forever. It just won't go away. Right? It's just this awesome book. And, and no matter how many fires they burn with Bibles and how many countries make it illegal, it just keeps on. You've seen the map. It just keeps on trucking, right? It's like the, 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 the perfection of God's word exists, and it doesn't need any help. And so what we want to do is to be an expository preacher doesn't pick topics because the, the fear of picking topics is that you forget some stuff, and a good pastor is supposed to preach the full counsel of God. So Genesis to Revelation, at some point in my whole life, I'd like to preach the whole thing. Don't know if I will. I'll probably stroke out up here the way I am. But, but, it, but before I get to Thessalonians or something, but, but I'm just saying, like, you're supposed to read it all. You're supposed to, people, you need to know what it says, right? People need to know. So you just kind of go through step by step. This is how he's laid it out. This is what you preach. The stuff that's in there sometimes, we were talking about it. Like, he even, I, can I put you under the bus? He's like, man, you guys, you rip us down the last couple of weeks. Can I hear something positive? 
Here, here's the thing. Nothing in the Bible immediately when you hear it is like positive because the whole book, why is the book even written? Just think about that. Just think about the reason why it's written. Because we do everything wrong. <laughs> if you didn't, we wouldn't need the Bible, right? He made people in his image to be like him, right? And if, and if we were rocking it the way he wanted us to live, there'd be no Bible. He'd just be like, hey, this, he, like he said originally, this is very good. But guess what? He doesn't say that anymore because it's not very good. So he writes this Bible because every single page, who can admit it with me? Every page you read tells you something you don't want to hear. And nobody likes to hear it. <laughs> I get it, right? So when you cherry pick the Bible and you tell people what they want to hear, you can fill a church because they don't want to hear stuff that confronts their sin. So, so but when you, when, you're, <laughs> when you feel led of God to just be an expository guy, like, this is, so I said, hey, what did we do in the first week of the book of Acts? We talked about the main theme of it, and then we talked about what? Acts chapter 1. Holy Spirit's go to Jerusalem. Here, Holy Spirit's going to come. It's going to drop. This is what you're going to do. That's the first series, the first sermon we did. And then what happened after that? Then Pentecost, when they all got together. So we spent a little time talking about when they all got together and what happens. That's perfect. Then the next week, it took off, and the next week, here we are. Next, very next subject. This is how we learn. We want to learn who God really is. Don't leave any part of him out. So and look it. Nobody wants to hear this stuff. They don't want to hear this stuff, right? The Bible says that in the last days, the people will gather around. That first of all, they won't want sound doctrine, and they'll gather teachers around them to tell them what they want to hear. I know every single week that you don't want to hear what I have to say. But listen, if, 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 if God is, is, is a loving God, and I know that he is, and if your pastor loves you in any which way, which I'm telling you that I do, which I don't show ever, I get it, that's me, but I do love you, then I and him both want you in the greenest pastures. Right? The greenest pasture is found in the text. It's right there, right? And so even though you hear it and you're like, I don't like that. Tell me something positive. It is positive. Because if you'll do it, you'll get the most positive result. Right? But if you don't know and you don't do it, you're not gonna get, you might get the world's best. You won't get God's best. And I trade the world's best for God's best any day. Any day. And I still don't even know what it is. Or whatever I said. But you know what I'm saying, right? I'd get rid of the world stuff to have God stuff. Clear. Okay. So, but, and listen, here's the thing. I don't even know what the best that God would offer is because I've never done what this says. I'm trying. I hope you are too. So let's just go through the text, see what it says. And if you hear something you don't like, just know that God wrote it for his glory and your blessing. Just do it. Just do it, do it, do it, okay? So here, here's where we are. Acts chapter, Acts chapter 2, verse 14. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully. I'm not going to shout. If the room was really full, I'd scream. Listen carefully, all of you. I would like, I'd do like that, though. Like, he's like, clear. Like, listen up. It's not just he's up here preaching. Did you ever hear a preacher when he just, he's talking, all of a sudden he goes, hey, listen. Now listen. Pay attention to me. Like, he's really going to make a point. Peter's like, listen up carefully. Listen, listen, listen. Doesn't want anyone to miss this, right? Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. All of you, fellow Jews and re residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. this pe these people, see, they just started speaking in tongues. and everyone, Some of the people thought, hey, this is great. I got the message of Jesus. I'm going to go back to my hometown and tell everyone about it. And some people thought, man, they're just wasted drunk, right? They're just drunk. And so he's like, no, no, no. These people aren't drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. There's a lot of jokes we could tell there, but we'll just leave it alone. Um, now, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. So he starts quoting this prophetic message from the prophet Joel from like 800 years earlier, right? And like, listen, Peter's not an expert, they said, but yet he knows a little bit, right? So what he knows, what does he do? He tells. He knows something, so he tells. So a lot of us think, well, this guy's like, he knows all the prophets and minor prophets. And the, no, 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 no. This guy was already told by someone who really knows. This guy doesn't know much. But he does quote what he does know. And he says, hey, listen, Prophet Joel, in the last days, this is what Joel said 800 years ago. And this is what's happening right now. God says this, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I'll pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike. And they'll prophesy, and I'll cause wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark. The moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. People of Israel, listen! Exclamation mark. He's really getting after it, right? God publicly endorsed Jesus of Nazareth. 
by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of lawless Gentiles. Man, he's just, just, just hammering these people, right? You nailed him to the cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in his grip. That was a great place for an amen, just in case you want. Yeah. We don't need to read the, the, the next prophet. We're going to talk about that, this little prophetic word from King David, but you can read it later on. Um, verse 29, dear brothers, think about this. You can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself, for he died and he was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. See, with the prophecy there, you see it. Some would say, well, he's talking about himself, but Peter, you know, he just wants to clarify. Like, that's not about him, because he is dead, right? He's dead, dude, so we don't talk about him. He's dead. His tomb is still here among us. But David was a prophet, verse 30, and he knew God had promised an oath to, that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. So God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, this is this God's right hand, this is God, the Father, as he has promised, gave Jesus this, this, the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see in here today. So he's explaining, like, this thing that you're seeing here, all these people speaking in tongues and everything, this is the, this is the prophetic message that was given. This is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And so then there's another prophetic word from King David from way back when. <clears throat> and then he says this in verse 36. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Okay? Lord and Messiah. I'm going to hold off on reading the rest of it. So we don't need a deep lesson in theology here and all this kind of stuff. We don't need to get in-depth study of these prophecies. But we do know this. Of all three of these prophecies, you put them all together. And what we see is this Jesus and his spirit spreading across the globe to people. And by doing so, the people of God would boldly speak of Jesus to the nations. Okay, And also, to fully appreciate what's going on here with Peter in this sermon you have to know that this everyday Joe screwdriver, this Joe Schmo from Idaho, this dude who doesn't have much in the way of scriptural training, he's just a fisherman, right? He opens up his mouth in, on this day. Now remember the context here. Jesus had just been crucified. His leader, the guy who came preaching a kingdom of which he's the king, he preaches this and the authorities kill him because of it. And Peter knows that this could happen to him. But yet he still stands boldly up and says, hey, Jesus is Lord. So super bold from Peter. Now you remember something about Peter, right? He was super shy and afraid. Jesus got arrested and, and Peter backed up and said, I don't want anything to do with him. I don't know that guy. But now, worse than getting arrested, he gets tortured and killed. So you'd think if Peter was afraid back then, he's certainly going to be afraid now. But he's not. He steps boldly forward and preaches that Jesus Christ is is Lord, right? That's crazy. That's crazy. So it's kind of cool about Peter because he, he's bold about his preaching. He's got this big audience. 3,000 people got saved, so I don't know how many people were actually there. I doubt he's batting 1,000. I doubt everyone got saved, maybe, but I, I doubt it because I think, I don't know, if, it's, if every single person got saved, the Bible would probably say that. You know what I mean? Like, and everyone got saved that day because it does say that sometimes. When Paul preached in Asia Minor, it said that the word of the Lord was heard by all of Asia Minor. So God's not afraid to say what it really is. But it says 3,000 people got saved. But how many people were there? How many people were confrontational to his message, right? We just heard that there was a bunch of people that were, Hosanna, Hosanna, here comes the, the Lord. But then some people were saying, kill him. Then they killed the guy. And here's Jesus, I mean, here's Paul, uh, Peter preaching to all these people, Jew, Gentile. All kinds of different people, right? Did you ever go to church? This, is, this message is called Be Bold, right? Did you ever go to church? And they're getting ready to do the offering, right? And I don't know, the pastor gets up or the announcement person gets up or the, 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 the offering person gets up, right? You've heard it all many times. And they get up and getting ready to do the offering and the music starts playing, you know. 
And the guy, the gal says, this is the time in the service when we give our offerings to the Lord. We want to partner with him and push the gospel to the ends of the, you know, the whole routine, right? And then they'll say this. Now, if you don't go here, this isn't for you. This is for members of this church, right? If you're not a member of this church, then, you, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to do that. This is, this is for us. Did ever, anyone ever hear that? Right? Why do you do that? We don't want to offend them, right? Because we don't want to lose them. We just, they just came. And, and we, want them to, we want to make sure they come back. Got to make sure they come back, right? So we don't want to offend anybody and say, hey, this offering isn't for you. It's just for the members of this family. So if you would like to come and just suck in them and, and just be a consumer, go for it, man. It's okay, right? Because we don't want to offend anybody. But look at Peter here, right? He's an equal opportunity offender. He offends everybody. He steps up in front of all these people, right? Jews, Gentiles, Romans. It says, oh, listen up, all of you, Jews and residents of Jerusalem. So he's saying, listen. All the people that are Jewish, that don't like this Jesus guy because he's claiming to be God, you're mad, right? Get ready. How about all these other people that live here in Jerusalem? Because not just that all Jews live there. I come from Sharon, 80% Jewish people, right? But that doesn't mean there's no Gentiles there. There's all kinds of other people there, right? There's, there's, there's Christians and there's Catholics and there's Muslims and atheists and all kinds of stuff. Then there's Unitarians. They just decide whatever they want to do, right? Everybody's there. And so he's like, listen, Jews and residents of Jerusalem alike, that means Jews, Gentiles. Listen, Romans, Romans, the ones who are, who are taking over the, the, the country and oppressing the Jewish people, the soldiers, the mean guys, the bad guys, right? The ones who stomp down any type of rebellion. And, and, and Peter stands up and shouts, Jesus is Lord and Messiah for all of you. Bold, bold. Every knee should bow, right? That's bold. But listen, listen, this, this is where it gets to you, right? Don't you, do you think that when Peter was getting ready to get up there and do that, that he kind of felt maybe like we do sometimes? Like, I'm about to say this, but they're probably going to refuse me, right? I don't want to open my mouth because I might fail. They might not like me anymore. And, and if I give my message, they're going to refuse me, and they're going to refuse Jesus, and they're not going to take me up on my offer. And you start talking yourself right out of it, right? Yeah, yeah. All of us have done it, including your preacher. I do it all the time. Don't you think Peter feels like that a little bit too? Don't you think he's feeling a little bit like, nah, maybe they won't accept me. Maybe they... Oh, and by the way, um, they just nailed my Jesus up to a cross and killed him. So, so, so not just possible re rejection, not just possible failure, right? But the possibility of torture and death. And Peter says, I don't care. And he steps up and he speaks anyway, right? No, and knowing all, knowing all this, like I could fail, they could reject me, they could torture, they could kill me. But knowing all of that, bold means knowing all of it and doing it anyway, right? That bold, boldness isn't, isn't the response to an a, a absolute definitive yes answer. Like if I do this, it's going to work, so therefore I will. Right? Some of us are like that. I won't take the step till God shows me the next step, and then I'll do it. Because I know what's going to happen, so then I'll do it. And Peter's like, I don't know the next step. I don't know if they're going to reject it. I don't know if they're going to say yes or no or kill me, but I'm doing it anyway. Right? I'm doing it anyway. But why does he do this? And more importantly, why, does, why, why should you do this? Because we know Peter, he, he's going to be in the, in the Faith Hall of Fame. The question is, will you make the Faith Hall of Fame? I want to make the Faith Hall of Fame, right? I want to make the Faith Hall of Fame. And, 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 and so why should we, knowing that people might reject us, that people might say yes, might say no, might, we might lose friendship, we might lose family members, we might lose a job, we might lose money, we might lose all kinds of reputation. Whatever it is that we could lose, we could lose, we could gain, we don't know, but why is it that I should step forth knowing all that and still open my mouth boldly? Well, Paul gives us the answer. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You have a Bible, you should look. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. This is what Paul says. And it's really not Paul, right? Paul's just the howdy doody with a pen. And God's like, write that, write that, write that, write that, write that. I want my people to know why they should be bold for me. Here it is. Jesus died for everyone. So that those who receive his new life, raise your hand if you've received the new life in Christ. Raise your hand. 
Oh, every single person in the room, right? That's awesome. Okay, so it's talking to you. Jesus died for everyone, which includes you, but everyone else, right? So that those who received his new life, you guys, will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they'll live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. And, and listen, it's not just them, you. It's them all, right? He died for all. At the beginning of the verse, he died for all at the end of the verse. He died for everyone, so no more of your own stuff. This is like a total brain explosion transformation, right? My plan, my pleasure, my comfort, my anything is now on the back burner, and I take Jesus off the back burner and his mission, and I put it onto the front burner of my life. That's what this scripture says. That's why you're willing to be bold because what happens to you or what you like, listen, loved ones, it doesn't matter anymore. If you've been saved, you're saved for on purpose, intention, for a reason. This is the reason. Because those who've received new life will no longer live for themselves but live for Christ. And what's Christ doing? Dying for people. Seeking and saving that which is lost. So that means that's why you live, to seek and save that which is lost. To spread the kingdom of Christ to the ends of the earth, to all the peoples. And so Peter here, he's not some fanatic. He's not some fanatic at all. No, he's actually just simply displaying the way that everyone who is saved should live. Right? That's what it says here. Listen, he died for everyone so that those who receive his new life. You raised your hand. I did. I received new life, just like Peter did. And so if I receive new life, I should live for Christ because of that. Remember that a couple weeks ago I shared with you if, you, if you receive the message but then ignore it, right? That's what's happened here. That's what happens to a lot of people. They receive this new life and do nothing with it. Nothing changes. No pursuit of the lost. No evangelism, no serving, no giving, no, pra- no, trauma- no dramatic change in their life. And it says here in the text that if you've received new life, you no longer live for yourself. So we're to be bold. And some will refuse this. And some will reject your offer. But listen, some might say yes. Some might say yes. And so the practical in all that is is this. We know that if you don't speak, they won't know. And one of the things that we are afraid of, and I'm sure Peter was too, and we all probably are, including me, is we're not willing to put ourselves aside and risk anything so that someone could go to heaven. That's a problem. And this is not, I'm not picking on Karen or Dawn or, or Carl or Nick, like right here. Just in general, look, the, the, the church in, of Jesus Christ in America is plummeting. It's growing in other countries, but here it's plummeting. And why? Because we're told not to share religion and politics, and so we cower and we don't. Because we don't want to offend and we don't want to hurt any feelings. And we don't want to lose any of our own privilege. So the threat is, if you don't preach that homosexuality is okay, we're going to take your tax-exempt status. And the sad thing is that some churches will stop preaching sin because they don't want to lose tax-exempt status. Because if I lose tax-exempt status, people that really give a lot of money, they usually want a tax write-off. And if, I, if Donald's a millionaire, let's, you know, and, and he wants to donate a million dollars to the church, most successful businessmen and women won't do that unless they can get a tax write-off. So what we'll do is we'll cave to that because we want to make sure we can keep getting that money. And we can't do that. We have to be bold, even if some people absolutely hate what we're saying and if they hate you because you're saying it. Just think about this for a second. Christ died for them. He died for them, not just you. So if he died for them, would you be willing, loved ones, would you be willing to sacrifice something so that someone could get saved? You know what Paul said? Paul, who's going to heaven, right? Garen, would you guys agree that he's there? Right. For those of us that think you go there right away, he's there. For those of us that think you sleep and then go, he's going to be there. We all agree that, right? Okay, awesome. 
Right? But he even said in, in one of his books, he said, I would, I would be willing to be forever cursed if my people Israel would know Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. I would be willing to go and burn in hell forever so that Kathy could get saved. Fanatic, right? But it's not. That's the way we're supposed to be. And if we, just imagine a second here. Just, can we just imagine? Imagine what it would be like if we were all like that. What would church be like on Sunday morning? <sighs> can you imagine? It would be insane. It would be insane. And that's what, listen, this is why I'm, I'm like a super pushy guy. I'm always pushing this is because that's the green pasture God wants you in. That's the green pasture he wants his church in. That's the green pasture he desperately wants the entire city of Leesburg to be in. And that's the way to get there. So some people will say yes. Some people will say no. We don't know what they're going to say, right? We don't know. But he says, be bold anyway and do it. And some will refuse and some will reject and some will say yes. But Paul would tell us in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 17 that, like, we're the stench of death and doom to those who are going to say no. Like, to the person you go up to and you share boldly and, and they don't want to hear it, you are the stench of death. Like, I don't like it. I don't like you. I don't like your message. Keep your stinking preaching to yourself. I don't want to hear it. Save it for your church people on Sunday morning. Can we just go play bingo? I don't want to hear it, right? But it also says we're a life-giving perfume to those who say yes to Jesus. Like the person who hears it and goes, that's the best news I've ever heard. I could be forgiven. I, you understand who I am? Yeah, I could be forgiven. Yes, you could be forgiven and have heaven where all the good people are. Yeah, I'm in. They love that, right? So to some, you're the stench of death and doom. To some, you're a life-giving perfume. Some will say yes and some will say no for sure. But for Peter, for Paul, for you and for me and for all of us that are Christ followers, we learned something a couple Wednesdays ago here in church. You have to be willing to be the stench of death and doom to be the sweet fragrance and perfume to some. You have to be willing to have people hate you and deny you in order to somehow be fortunate enough to bring that life-giving perfume to some who would say yes. And you don't know which ones are going to say yes. So you have to be like Peter. I'm going to step forward. They might kill me. They might say no. But Jesus is Lord and Messiah. And some of the people probably said, ah, phooey. No good. You're terrible. Crucify that dude. But listen, if he hadn't done what he did and, and jeopardizing himself, sacrificing possibly, what happens to those 3,000 people that got saved? That might, probably wouldn't have happened. And you have to be willing. So I, I'm not, I wasn't there, and we're, I don't want to assume things in the Bible. I, I mean, I'm a Bible guy, but if they had just crucified Jesus for him saying, I'm the king, isn't there a strong possibility that Peter could get crucified for doing the same thing? They're like, dude, you just crucified. You, ki said, you killed him, right? You all killed him. Yeah, we did. You want me to do it to you too? Right? He could have done that. <coughs> but he was willing to put his life on the line for those 3,000 people. That's considering others above yourself. And that's what we need to do. And some are going to respond well. And if you've ever had that happen, you get to lead someone to the Lord. It's just nothing like it. But then again, some won't. Some won't. And we don't know who's going to say yes or no, but we do know that people can't say yes and the kingdom won't grow unless those who have been forgiven and empowered by that Holy Spirit open up their mouth. Step up and speak out. We have to. And then, when, and listen, we're not just talking about you personally now. Like when you go to work or the gym or whatever you do, right? My thing is this thing, right? This is the thing that God put me in charge of. I hate saying that because I don't think highly of myself, but I, that's my job. Can't help it. So, so as, a, as a church, right, as a family, we've got to be bold. We, gotta, we just got to be able to, to, to preach the truth of God's word to anyone who walks in this building. Like, this is what we're going to do. You gather up in this place on the weekend, you're going to hear it, bro. That's just the way it goes. And you, and you might walk out of here and think, man, that's the stench of death and doom. I don't, to hell, listen, to hell with that. I'm out of here. 
could happen, right? But while that happens, someone might be sitting right there, right? We all know Deliah, right? We know she's saved as saved can be, but she might walk in here, and, I, and we don't know her, right? And she hears this stuff, and she's convicted to the core. It pierces their heart, and she's like, what do I got to do? Right? But we'll never get there unless we're willing to just say the truth boldly to whoever God puts in front of us. Okay? So, you'll see also that when, by reading this, that not only did this average Joe open his mouth boldly, but it was clear in his message that a timely response to the message is always required. Always required. Look, look here in verse 17. What is he saying here? In the last days, God says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do this. And you've seen it happen, he says, right? Like you've wa- you guys are all sitting here. You've congregated into Jerusalem from all over the area. And you've walked up to this house where everyone's speaking it in your language. And you see in the last day, Joel said in the last days, this is what's going to happen. And Peter's like, yeah, see that stuff right there you're watching? It's happening. It's the last days. It's the last days. Last days, last days. A lot of people talk about the last day. We're in the last days. It's coming. Jesus is coming back. I don't know. I know one thing. We're in the last days. Because he said in the last days, this is what's going to happen, and it just did. So what does that mean? We're in the last days, right? Last days, okay, that's awesome. We're in the last days. Last days. Last days before What? Right? Well, just, we don't want to figure out anything on our own, right? Look at this here. Look in the text. Last day is what? Before the great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. That's what it is. So last days before that, some translations would say great and notable, uh, great and awesome, great and manifest day of the Lord. I mean, it's all you got to do is read the Bible a little bit, and you see this day of the Lord, day of the Lord, day of the Lord, day of the Lord. It's all throughout the Bible, right? And it's coming. That's why it's all strewn through the Bible, right? Heads up, everyone. Wake up, everyone. The, 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 the day of the Lord is coming. This prophet says it. This prophet says it. This guy says it. That guy says it. The day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord. Why is he doing this? Because the day of the Lord is coming. Wake up, Right? Urgent, urgent, right? Did you ever see that, um, what's that old show? Danger, danger, right? Will Robinson, right? Whoa, wake up, everybody, right? He's like, the day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. Sense of urgency in the message. The day of the Lord's no joke. Isaiah, the prophet, called it a day of cruel wrath and fierce anger, the lowering of the proud and the lofty. That's the day of the Lord, the day, the glorious, great, notable, awesome, manifest day of the Lord. And it's coming. You know what manifest means? He's showing up. He's showing up. That's what manifest is, right? He's showing up. He's showing up. The universe is filled with himself. But one day, he's going to be standing in front of your face, right? That's what manifest means, right? Who's, who's the president of our country? Donald Trump, right? Is he the president no matter where you are in your country? Right, but, some, but, but what happens if he shows up right in the room, right? That's a little bit different. Than it, we know he's in charge of the whole country, right? I'm just, I'm dumbing it down so we could all hear. But, because he ain't God. But, but he's the president of the whole country, but yet, but when he's right there in the room, it's just something different, right? So, so we know that Jesus is the Lord of the universe, but one of these days he's going to be in your face. That's the day of the Lord. The great and manifest day of the Lord. Let me see it, tell, show you what it looks like. Go to the book of Revelation. Chapter 19. What's it going to look like? What's it going to be like? What's it going to be like? What's it going to be like? Revelation 19, verse 11. Use your imagination when you read the book of Revelation. You want to see it, right? It's cool stuff in there, right? So imagine this. And you know what you guys could probably do? Just for fun, you can write down the reference to test to make sure I tell you right. But then you know what would be really cool? You can close your eyes. I'll read it to you. And you can imagine it, right? Imagine this. Imagine this. You ready? This division that John has of how that's going to go down. Then I saw heaven open, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood. And his title was the Word of God. 
The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will, be rule, he will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God, the Almighty, like juice flowing from a winepress. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That is the great and glorious manifest day of of the Lord. And when he says he's going to unleash the wrath, it's because something is going to happen right then and there. Something's going to happen right then and there. And Jesus gives us a warning in Matthew 24 that listen, this this is urgent. Pay attention to this. Because it's going to be like a thief in the night. You're going to be at home sleep and thinking everything's okay when you go to bed at night. Isn't that the way you feel? I can go to bed and I'm cool, cool, lay down, we're good, day's over, I'm going to rest, everything's fine. Boom, here he comes. When you think, every, like he says in, in, in Matthew 24, like the days of Noah, it's going to rain. Yeah, okay. It's going to rain. Yeah, sure. Sure, yeah. All right, yeah, I go to my party, go to my friend's house, watch the football game, let's go fishing, let's do this, let's do that. Bam, it rains, floods, kills everybody. And Jesus says, that's the way it's going to happen, and guess what? Here's why it's urgent. I don't even know when it's going to happen. The angels don't even know when it's going to happen. One day, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I'll come back. When everything's ready is going to be when his father, the sovereign father of the universe, says, now, son, and wham, he's going to come. And in that moment, judgment comes because when he shows up, you're either in or you're not. He says, I'm going to come back and gather with me, mine, and I'll bring them with me forever. You can read about that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and chapter 5. And the question that I have for you is, will he gather you? That's all that matters. Will he gather you and take you with him forever? The Holy Spirit is going to convict us of the coming judgment. And so if you're feeling a little bit, maybe someone online watching it or will watch it, they feel convicted like, man, I want to be ready for that. If you're feeling anything like that, if all of a sudden the end, the final days, the last days, the judgment of Jesus, all that, if that's like starting to resonate, like, man, maybe there's something to that, that's the Holy Spirit of God convicting you of the coming judgment. And maybe you need to do something about it. See, there's a, there should be at least a sense of urgency in our witness and in our response to Jesus. And that's why God put it right there in the text. Why did he put it in there? Why did he put it in there? This, this last days before the second coming, the great and glorious day of the Lord, he put it in there because he wants us to act and act now. What's the name of the book? Acts. He wants us to do something, right? He wants us to do something. Time vanishes quickly. How many people, who, who was it? My Greg Orr was at my house today. Man, time's flying. I'm old. Right? You're old. You're old. You're, we're all old. Hey, Charlie's not old. I've known Mike since he's a little kid. He's married. He's got kids. What's going on, right? Time's just... Bam, 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 bam. It's vanishing quickly. And the great and manifest day of the Lord is closer than ever before. It's so urgent, like it's coming. But the good news is right there in the next verse. But even though it's coming, listen, why you still have time? Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord should be saved. It's calling the Lord, calling the Lord right now, right now, right now, because the day of the Lord's coming. Do something. (laughs) <laughs> it's the crazy thing. I don't know when it's going to all happen. But listen, if it was urgent then, what is it now? <laughs> 2,000 years urgenter. <laughs> Man, we got a job to do, church. We got a job to do. Reaching people with this urgent call of repentance and faith in Christ. That's the task of Revolution Church, man. That's what we have to do somehow, some way. I need your help. But listen, loved ones, if you've received this new life, if you've been saved, then I beg, even for the most faithful servant in this house, I beg you to ponder the love 
that God has for you and for these people that you don't even know. And let that love for you and them compel you to be bold, to invite, to engage, to do something, to pray for them, to give more, to serve more, to pray more, to involve and engage in what God is doing, to be bold. Open your mouth and speak. The day of the Lord is rushing upon the, the lost and unchurched people in your life, and God's placed you in their life as the ambassador for Christ. How will they know unless they are told? Now, so, 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 so you, you, you're here on purpose, right? You're on purpose. You didn't come here just to listen to the monkey up here yelling and screaming. You, you came on purpose, right? You came to learn, to grow, like equip me, Lord, help me, Lord, teach me, Lord, direct me, Lord. I'm on this thing, right? So, so what, I'm, what, I, what I want to say is that what God is looking for, based on what we read here, he wants an active response to what you read. Every single time you come here, Every single time you come here, there should be an active response to what you are read, you've read, or what you've been preached. Like, that's what you should do. Looking for an active response. I'm in on this thing. So, so here's a lesson I think that we could all learn and we could, we could put into our bag of tools, okay? Don't sugarcoat the gospel, Emma. And I don't know what that means to you, like when I say don't sugarcoat the gospel. But listen, don't tell people, and I've seen it, and I'm guilty of it, like way back in the day when we first started. And you just got to, if you just agree with what I'm teaching you here in Romans, then you're going to be saved. And anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. And if you believe in your, in your heart and confess with your mouth, you'll be saved. And like, just believe that and, 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 and trust that and, 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 and put them in your heart. Like, like, let Jesus into your heart and, and, and go to church. Like, I, that's awesome, right? And, and true salvation will have those indicators, right? You'll, you'll go to church. You'll believe. It'll be in your heart. Like, I get all that, right? But true salvation occurs only one way. Only one way. And the kingdom of God only grows one way. And it's back there in the text. It's the part I didn't read. Verse 36. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and and Messiah. So the speech comes to an end, right? In verse 37, that was the big left hook. He closes with that, right? And it says, Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we, what? Do. What should we do? What should we do? Right? People say, oh, you don't have to do anything. Jesus does it. No, 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 no. You read it. What should we do in response to who Jesus is? You have to do something. You don't invite him into your heart, right? You don't say the sinner's prayer. What does it say? This is Peter's words. So what should we do? Peter replies this. Each of you must repent of your sins, turn to God, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ to show that you've received forgiveness of your sin. Repent of your sin, turn to God, and then get baptized to show that you just did that. Right? That's what you're doing. Right? And then when you do that, what happens? Read on. And then you'll receive forgiveness, and then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we repent. What does that mean? No, 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 not yet. No, 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 no. no you read it. You read it. What's repent? My way is wrong. Everything I've ever done, God, wrong, right? My attitude's wrong. My vocabulary's wrong. My perspective is wrong. My priorities are wrong. All my actions are wrong. My vocabulary's wrong. Everything's wrong. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought I was in charge. I thought, you know, modern culture could dictate what's right and wrong, and I was just following the trends, and I did what my mom said, and I did what my friend said, and I thought I followed my heart. Huh. Right? Repent is, I'm sorry about all of that I've done. The problem with a lot of people is they'll do that. And then go right back to doing it again. <laughs> right? And part of being saved is to apologize for everything you've done wrong. But then instead of saying, yeah, I did all this stuff wrong. Thanks for the forgiveness. 
Now I'm going to go do it again. Because that's all the time, y'all. I, I mean, I'm talking about people in our church constantly, all the time, year after year, person after person. I'm sorry. I'm so, listen, how many times do you want your kids to say you're sorry before you say, okay, that's awesome. Just clean your room. Right? You don't want to, not, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And repentance should be the posture of every believer every day, all the time. I get that. But there has to be a turning. There has to be a, I'm sorry, and instead of chasing the stupid stuff more, I'm now, instead of going after that, not, not pausing and saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Yes. Awesome. Going back again, like a dodo, right? No, it's, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This stuff right here, it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. So I'm not going after that anymore. Now, I'm going after you. I'm going after you. And I'm going to let you dictate what I think and what I say and what I do and all, all that I think and all of that stuff, right? I'm on mission with you now. I'm not pursuing this stuff anymore. I'm doing that. And then I just get baptized, right, to show that I've been forgiven. So I repented. I said, I'm sorry, right? If you confess your sin to him, he's... It's faithful and just to forgive. So I, I've confessed my sin. He forgives me. I get in the tank to show everyone, hey, I, I repented and I turned to God. And he forgave me. Woo! Awesome. And then we receive his Holy Spirit. See, all those four things, the, this is me submitting and you and everyone submitting to the, and this sounds tacky, but the membership requirement of the kingdom of God. Right? If you want to get in, this is what you got to do. It's not just ask Jesus into your heart. Right? It's not a sinner's prayer. It's not a rosary. It's this. Repent of your sin. Turn to God. Be baptized. Receive the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says. How many people use Redbox? Raise your hand. Anyone? Redbox? 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 Right? Wouldn't it be nice if you just go up to the Redbox and go, Oh, the new uh, Aquaman. That's good. I'll take that one. And just take it on leave. Wouldn't that be great? Oh, I forgot. you got to put in your credit card, don't you? See, it would be nice. To just, I, but I want that movie. I want this movie. I, well, we don't care. You want to be a, you want a membership to this box, you got to put in your credit card, put in your email address, put in your zip code, and you got to pay for it. There's a requirement to get the movie. Right? And so there's a requirement to get into the kingdom of God. So don't, we don't want to downplay it, reduce it down, and make it so easy for everybody that they just need to say a prayer and believe that Jesus was the Messiah. You're in. No, no. Repent of your sin. Turn to God. Be baptized. Receive the Holy Spirit. That's what it says to do. Right? And so Jesus came preaching this. He came preaching this at the beginning, in Matthew chapter 4, 17. He says, listen to this. Does not sound familiar? Repent of your sin and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He said the same thing. And here again in our text, we just see a faithful doer named Peter taking action in response to what Jesus has done. And he echoes the exact words almost of his chief shepherd and says, each of you must repent of your sin and turn to God and get baptized to show that new life has begun. That's what it says. And that's what we need to do. So, I'm going to be bold. Kind of finishing up here. <clears throat> I mentioned it earlier. What's the name of the book? Acts, right? It's like the root word of action, right? It means you got to do something. It means we got to do something. And there's a lot of churches out there that are preaching so much grace. And there's a lot of Reformed theology out there. And I love my Reformed brothers and sisters, but that God does everything. He decides. And, and he's going to do everything. But, man, it's the book of Acts, man. <laughs> it's the book of Acts. It's the book of this is what they did. The writer of the book of Acts is Luke. And he writes his first book called Luke, original. And in this book, it's an exhaustive letter, an exhaustive study of who Jesus is and what he said and what he taught and what he did, right? That's what he wrote, the whole thing. We've studied the whole thing. You can read it. You can go online and see it all, or you read it yourself. We did it for like a year and a half or something crazy, right, through the whole book. He tells everyone, this is who Jesus is. This is what he said. This is what he taught. This is, what he, this is where he went. This is everything. This is all about Jesus. This is who he is. And then he writes the second letter. Why? 
to tell every, the same people, the same dude, Theophilus, this is who Jesus is, this is what he said, this is what he taught, and this is how they responded. That's the whole book of Acts. It's the Acts of the Apostles. It's the book that says, this is what we did. See, at the end of the day, this entire book is in the Bible to show us what a person should and will do action-wise in response to receiving the Holy Spirit, in response to receiving forgiveness, in response to receiving this new life in Christ. When, when the gospel really hits home, when the love of Jesus pierces the heart, when forgiveness is accepted deeply, that person doesn't have to be nudged and, and, and pushed and, and you have to, and, and you got to, no, 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 that person engages. That person engages on the, on, on the, on the compulsion of, of Christ's love for them. It pushes them to action. And you don't have to force it, and you don't have to beg them to come to church or beg them to go share the gospel with people. You don't have to beg them to do everything. They attend, and they involve, and they give, and they pray, and they serve, and they invite, and they study, and they pursue, and they speak. That's what a real lover of the Lord will do. And their days are filled with intention and purpose. Fear goes out the window. Comfort, out the window. What I want, my gain, goes. Listen, loved ones, I go. I guess throw that all away. And it's only then can I really then go. That's the only way to go. It's the only way to go. I'm building a kingdom, man. That's what he said, and we're supposed to be doing the same thing, building a kingdom. I'm an ambassador, a spokesman for the king of the universe. I'm the visible image of the invisible Jesus Christ, the king. And his love for me and for all the people should compel me to some sort of action, some sort of action. And so I just want to say this, and then we're done. If you're saved, if you've received new life, be bold. The days of complacency and cowering to whatever it is that would stop you from absolutely living out what the Bible says to do, including opening your mouth and sharing the gospel with people. Let that be in the rearview mirror. And if you're not saved then respond to the call to repent and turn to God and to be baptized. And I just want to say, if there's anybody that is watching now or might watch in the future, don't wait for that. Don't wait. If you've received this call and you're feeling convicted of the Holy Spirit, Go find a pool, go find a pond. Call us here at the church. We have a water tank. Repent of your sin, turn to God, and we'll baptize you. So I'm going to be very bold in my closing and just say this. The people in the Bible we read in the book of Acts they were super bold in their response to Jesus, weren't they? Like crazy bold. They preached and could have gotten killed. They met every, they sacrificed stuff by meeting in the temple and meeting in homes every day. They went to three o'clock prayer meetings. Like, what is that? In the middle of the day, they just stop what they're doing and go pray. Go to the temple and pray, right? It's just this massive sacrifice. And look what happened when they did that. 3,000 people got saved, Right? And then when they continued in this type of steadfast living, it says every day the Lord added to the church. Every day. And the church exploded. Right? Is the church exploding in America? Is it? No. About 4,000 churches close every year in America. I think it was the Southern, don't quote me, Southern Baptist Convention, I, said, I think, said that just a couple years ago that about 
four to 5,000 believers a day are saying no to the church. The church of Jesus Christ is exploding worldwide. But yet here on our clock, on, in our land, it is rapidly declining. Okay, so here's the thing. This is why I push, and, and nobody likes it. But listen, let's just do not play games, okay? They responded with massive sacrifice and action. It's the book of Acts. It's what they did, and the church exploded. And our church isn't exploding. So that's why I push you every single week, and nobody likes it. But if we want to see what God wants to see, which is all people saved, and his church explode from east coast to west, then, like it said, there's something you got to do, right? There's something we have to do. That's the church that we are. I don't know if that's the church that everyone wants, but I can't deny the fact that when I read the Bible and I see the church just explode, I see what happened just before it happened. I see what the people did in response to who Jesus is and what he did. And then it exploded. And then I look at us and the church in America. It's just not. So I want to give you an encouraging word, Donald. I love you. But there's nothing encouraging about that. But, it, but for the sake of the name of Jesus and for the good of his people, I would say that we just need to start doing. We need to do something. Okay? And I don't know what that means to you. Because some of you I know in this room are faithfully serving. <clears throat> but I would just say, at the risk of being hated, like Peter, right? He stood up and said it in front of everyone, right? Here's my friends who I love. <clears throat> it doesn't matter how faithful you are. It's not enough. It's just not enough. Like you read the Bible. If you seek me with your whole heart, you'll find me. Give your bodies as a living sacrifice. That that's your reasonable worship. Right? Everything. That's what he wants. And, and, and when a people gather their wagons around that, that church will explode. That's what I want to be part of. So take a few minutes and uh, just, you know, we said this before, sometimes the word is a, is a correction, sometimes it's a rebuke, sometimes it's an encouragement. Why don't you take a few minutes to just get with the Lord, just yourself, I won't say another word, and find out whether you're in need of a correction, in need of a rebuke, or you just received an encouragement. Like, let, your, let the text lay down and bear its weight upon your life right now. See where you're at. And then choose to take action and fix the problem. And if we all do that, 